done. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. And we have a very special guest today. I want to welcome Dr. Keith Berkowitz. He is a founding member of the FLCCC Alliance. Dr. Berkowitz's expertise combines both traditional and complementary medicine. Before starting the Center for Balanced Health, a private practice in internal medicine located in New York City, he was the medical director of the Atkins Center for Complementary Medicine and was a member of the teaching faculty at North Shore University Hospital. Dr. Berkowitz is the co-author of The Stubborn Fat Fix, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Flour-Free Eating, and the Princeton Review Medical School Companion. He received his Bachelor of Arts from Brandeis University, attended medical school at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York, received an MBA from Columbia Business School, and is a member of the Beta Gamma Sigma Honor Society. Dr. Berkowitz completed his residency in internal medicine at North Shore University Hospital and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Please welcome Dr. Berkowitz. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I, I'm so honored to get an opportunity to work with React 19 and, you know, sharing all the important work that they do on a daily basis. So I, I when I thought about talking about, you know, what I would start and what kind of topic I would do, I really thought about how do we start? And so one of the things I wanted to really look at is how do we start from the beginning, right? An individual comes into your office or, or someone and how do you start? What do you do first? What do you look at? What do you treat? What are the mechanisms behind it? And tonight we're gonna to talk about some of this and we'll follow with some questions and stuff. So I always like to begin a lot of my talks about, I use the term foundation. And, and where it's so important is traditionally medicine really looks at people from, we call a top-down approach, right? We are reactive, we treat symptoms, but really what we have to really think about, and you know, the COVID-19 experience has really taught us that's so important, we have to actually look the opposite way. We have to work from bottom up. We have to build a strong base, a strong foundation. And with that strong foundation, we really help the body work for itself. So critical in care. One of my colleagues once had a great term about, he talked about a diagnosis. He said a diagnosis is important for one thing, billing purposes. So when, when I went to look at symptoms of long-haul COVID, and, and tonight we're talking about vaccine injury, one of the things that's really kind of interesting is a lot of them are, share a lot in common. You know, we talk a lot about the neurological stuff. People get brain fog, fatigue, palpitations where they have this post-exertional aspects, trouble breathing, what, what I call often post-viral pleurisy, where the outer layer of the lungs are is inflamed, liver damage. And one of the things that's interesting about liver and pancreas is it may actually also contribute to another factor, which we're not talking about tonight, is blood sugar regulation. One of my biggest interests is to look at how glucose, which is you know what we get from our food, relates to insulin, which is the hormone made by the pancreas to be able to move glucose into the cell. And that dysregulation is one of the issues we see oftentimes in this process. One of the hardest symptoms I find, you know, has to do with tinnitus or ringing in the ears, loss of taste of smell, um, gastrointestinal issues such as diarrhea, gas and bloating, nausea, muscle. And so some of the etiologies, and, and I, I pick some of the most common ones. One we talk a lot about is POTS right, uh, autoimmunity, cardiac issues, MCAS, which is mast cell disease. We'll talk a little about that later. Activation syndrome, diabetes, reactive hypoglycemia, which is reactive low blood sugar, dysautonomia, where the nervous system does work, neuroinflammation, neuro small fiber, that's talked about a lot, coagulopathy, where people get either blood clots or microclotting, fatigue syndrome, reactivated viruses in Lyme, gut, dysbiosis or gut imbalance, viral persistence, whether it's COVID or previous other vex, you know, other virus, typically things like Epstein-Barr virus. And as I mentioned before, viral pleurisy. Viral pleurisy is an interesting one I, I see a lot of, and, and that's one where people have the shortness of breath 
with a normal oxygen level. And I almost tell people to use this kind of an example, it's like almost having your body wrapped in saran wrap, where if you try and take a deep breath, you're unable to. And so we'll talk about some of the different mechanisms behind that, right? We talked about one, which is really big, and I've learned a lot from uh, J.P. Sleepy. I know people have heard him talk before, which is reactivation of previous viruses in the body, reactivation of things like Lyme disease, reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus, herpes human virus 6, things like mycoplasma. So all these previous viruses that we've been exposed to in the past now get reactivated. A real damaging to the gut where we call dysbiosis, where the gut microbiome, which is a mixture of good and bad bacteria, gets really upset and imbalanced, and we get symptoms consistent with, we talked about before, leaky gut. Autoimmunity immune printing is a big one too, where people develop autoimmune syndromes. One of the most common ones we see in practice is autoimmune thyroid or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. What's interesting in vaccine injury, which we don't see oftentimes in typical autoimmune thyroid, is in these, a lot of these patients actually have normal thyroid function, where if you measure thyroid function by itself, it's normal. The most common measure of that is something called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. That could be normal in people, but when you actually do their autoantibodies, two of them we call thyroid peroxidase antibody and antithyroid glove antibody, those can be elevated. So they have not the normal features of, of thyroid function, but inflammation of the thyroid gland. But again, that's important to treat from that same aspect. Blood clotting, microclotting, one of the hardest diagnoses we can make or have to make, very difficult because a lot of lab tests are not, are not so accurate and don't always pick up all the cases. And again, a dysfunctional nervous system. Oh, I find that a lot of people, when they first come to see me, one of the main symptoms they feel is this hyperactive nervous system where they're hypersensitive to even touch their muscles ache. Like anything they do bothers them, sound sensitivity, light sensitivity. You know, they're unable to read for any particular period of time where they're just in this heightened, constant heightened state of hyper alertness where the nerves are always on 24 seven. So we'll talk about a, a couple of these, post-viral hypercoagulable state, histamine intolerance or mast cell activation syndrome. And one I brought in methylation issues. And we'll talk about that, the gene we call MTHFR and how I've actually started to see in practice and other providers as well, a correlation with people with that genetic pattern, which is about 30, 40% of the population and severity of symptoms post facts. So again, some of these apply to both long COVID and vaccine injury. One is viral debris. And, and what's interesting is, again, with both COVID and the vaccine, we talk about the spike protein. So you can have the same kind of spike protein response where the immune system gets inflamed. And, and one of the major triggers of that is the Epstein-Barr virus. I mean, I think a lot of us know when we're younger, we've gone through infectious mono when we're teenagers or you know, young people, it's the kissing disease, it's always known of. But what we're seeing now is a reactivation of this disease process. And one of the mechanisms behind it, we're finding that the vaccine inactivates certain things we call Tor receptors, which almost act like the cage for this virus. Like this, what's interesting about herpes viruses, we know this from varicella zoster, you know, shingles, or from herpes simplex, they often live dormant in our nerve nervous system. And it takes kind of a stress or another infection or something to kind of bring it back out. What we're seeing with Epstein-Barr virus, which some people think are about up to two thirds of vaccine injured individuals have, is that it's actually either reactivated or acute. And for the first time in my career, I'm actually seeing patients that are in the 50s and the 60s, I have a woman as old as 80 with acute Epstein-Barr virus. And one of my, my patients who's over 80, she's actually had acute titers over a year. So that this, this virus can be both reactivated and acute. The, the challenge is, and what makes Epstein-Barr virus so interesting in this case, is that traditionally we also looked at titers we call IgG, which is the long-term titers of, of herpes Epstein-Barr virus as being normal. But now we're finding that in reactivated cases, those viral titer levels can go up extremely high and can be representative of issues. Recent literature, um, they actually started looking at autoimmune diseases and they found, for example, things like rheumatoid arthritis, even Hashimoto's, 
there was a big study in multiple sclerosis that Epstein-Barr virus itself can be the trigger and activate this kind of autoimmune process. And again, it's, it's these toll-like receptors, which act, as I was saying before, which activate as a cage. And the problem actually post COVID vaccine, toll receptor four, toll receptor seven, toll receptor eight, basically don't respond well. And those are the things that really in our body have kept this virus in check. So now no longer having that, you know, toll receptor that keeps that virus, now that virus is starting to attack the body in a large way, we see symptoms such as swollen glands, uh, malaise, fatigue, excuse me one second. People can have elevated liver function, all symptoms of that nature. And then we talk about the hypercoagulable state. Well, for me, one of all the states we deal with with all those mechanisms, this one is one of the toughest for me. And the reason why is it's not an easy one to diagnose. Everyone sees in the news, they talk about checking your D-dimer or fibrinogen activity, which are two members measures of fibrin activity or thickness of blood supply as kind of a diagnostic factor for that. But we're learning now more and more that many patients have this microclotting issues and actually have negative lab tests. And really the most accurate diagnostic techniques is forensic micro microscopy, which only a few practitioners around the world are doing. One is Jordan Baum in Alabama. There's also Dr. Petros in South Africa to really see, and what they're finding is the presence of microclotting in many more patients than we previously thought so. And the question is this immune related? Is this uh, where the body's just making more fibrin? Where it can't break down. And we're still learning more about that at this point. And one of my favorite topics is histamines. So we always think of histamines, right? Traditionally, we think of allergies, right? People think of, I have an allergy, I have a sore throat. Um, I'm, you know, then I get a histamine reaction. We take antihistamines, things like Benadryl, Claritin. So that, that's one measure of histamines. That's one way it works. But histamines also work there at both that in the allergy system, category in acute inflammatory process, but they also are a measure of chronic inflammation. And one of the problems with histamines, if histamines don't go away, they can actually cause damage within this system. They can affect our immune response. I mean, we, I've read studies, example on Parkinson's where they found elevated histamine in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra. We see histamines more in the, there tend to be in the gastrointestinal system and trigger something called mast cell activation syndrome. And mast cells can activate all these parts of the body and can trigger kind of those allergy-like symptoms, but also trigger fatigue, brain fog. Um, it can affect blood pressure. I have, I have an interesting case I saw recently in the office. A woman actually had a cardiac event about one month later post her vaccination and with really no history of any kind of cardiac symptoms. She's not a high-risk category. She's in her 50s. What it turns out when I actually, I saw her several months later, I measured her histamine levels. They were 40, 50 times normal. So that acute histamine response never went away. And that caused that acute inflammatory response around her coronary vessels, which caused that cardiac event. So we never used to think of histamines as an issue, but it's really important. And the other one, which is, I find kind of interesting is it also affects the way our muscles function. For us to be, go running or do any kind of exertional activity, our body needs to use histamines to be able to accomplish that process. The problem is when that system's dysfunctional, that process doesn't take place appropriately. And we talk about one of the more disabling symptoms is the cognitive impairment, brain fog, the fatigue, and what they, not only mast cells are part histamine, but they're also something called tryptase, cytokines, vermicytokines. We talk about those pro-inflammatory mediators that cause damage within the body. Typically, when we kind of look to see if there's a histamine or mast cell activation syndrome, we look at either measuring histamine level or for a mast cell activation syndrome, tryptase level. The one problem with doing tryptase levels is often they'll be normal unless you catch an individual in acute response. If they have an acute histamine or mast cell you know, issue that, then we'll see that. 
Prior to COVID, we used to see the most severe mast cell in people with mold exposure. And what's interesting about that, that group that had mast cell activation syndrome prior to COVID and vaccination are often the individuals I see now, which now are struggling more post-vaccination with much more symptoms where their mast cell activation syndrome has really been ramped up to another level. So, so one that I wanna talk about the MTHFR gene. I, I won't say it out because I'm not good at uh, saying out the parks, but it's actually a very interesting gene. It, it's found in about 30 to 40% of the population. We originally thought about in Europeans, in especially Eastern European Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, we see it in Mediterranean population, where it's so interesting, where, where it has an effect, it, it allows our body where, to convert folate into a usable version of folate called methylfolate. And why that's so important is that methylfolate is so important as a building block. And one of the biggest building blocks is for producing your neurotransmitters, which affect mood. Like we all talk about serotonin, which is one of the main ones with GABA, relax the brain, or on the opposite side from an excitatory standpoint, norepinephrine, uh, dopamine, dopamine does both. And what's interesting, what I find that individuals who are vaccine injured who have this MTHFR gene, and it could be two different mutations, one 677, there's another one called 1298. You can have one or two, depending on whether you got it from one parent or two parents. And what's interesting, they have a lot of trouble dealing with stress, especially stress in the body. And it doesn't have to be emotional stress, it's physical stress. And I find that my sickest patients who actually post vaccine injury seem to carry this genetic marker. And in people that have the 677 with two copies are more at risk of arterial damage and blood clots. One of the measures we look for looking at is homocysteine. And we now know homocysteine is, is a really good marker as people age for cognitive function. When we look at things like dementia as people get older, one of the main markers to look at to see the risk of cognitive decline is actually measuring homocysteine levels, which is a combination marker of vitamin B12, vitamin B6, and folic acid. And it also affects the body's ability to make glutathione. Glutathione is a very important substance. A lot of people talk about you know, things like N-acetylcysteine, which is well talked about, which impacts the ability for the body to get rid of reactive oxidation, oxygen species. So now that we have a baseline, where do we start? So we all know this is a, a maze. I, I wanted to take a different approach tonight. And I wanted to start with the approach of really calming down the, the hyperactive system. My, one of my thoughts in treating people is to really start by bringing the body back to homeostasis, to really bring it back to baseline. And one of the most important things I always talk about is correcting dehydration. One thing that I was always taught, I worked my early career as a hospitalist, I worked as an in-hospital physician. When people were sick and, or people went to the emergency room, the first thing they actually gave you was the intravenous fluids. That was always the first to try and, you know, make sure that you're well hydrated, that your blood pressure your pulse is good, but that was always the first treatment. And, and I think what's been so struggling during this pandemic is that a lot of people are now treated at home, so we've lost that opportunity to do that when people are sick. The next one is immunomodulation, which is what really means is getting the immune system to function, to calm down. We all know about a hyperimmune system, right, with allergies or autoimmune, or a suppressed immune system where people get opportunistic infections, you know, diseases like HIV becoming AIDS is one too. And then also the other two things is balance, the gut microbiome, bring that back, and also lifestyle modifications. We were talking about how, you know, the branching between allopathic and integrated medicine. And I think the, the amazing part of treating vaccine injury is that it really requires both, that we've learned that both methods need to be used to have successful care. So dehydration, so the question is, how do you recognize it? Um, one way is to look at what we call BUN creatinine ratio, which is a measure of kidney function, or what I call a urine specific gravity, which has, shows you how concentrated urine is. When you look at urine, that it's very dark yellow as opposed to clear. Um, when this we do when we try and diagnose POTS, but there's look at people where the drop in blood pressure, rise in pulse when they go from lying down to sitting to standing, 
or, and this is what I see very commonly a lot of individuals, what they call low ADH level or antidiuretic at home or low aldosterone level. I, I see many individuals and with clear signs of dehydration, dry skin, dry lips, thirsty all the time. But when we look at their urine, urine looks normal. And then I measure an antidiuretic hormone and it's very suppressed. So the body in that case, especially the kidneys, does not recognize that we dehydrated. And then people will often urinate often. And I, I hear this comment from people all the time. I'm urinating all the time. How can I be de dehydrated? And then we actually give them intravenous fluids. And what's interesting, which is a much more concentrated with sodium chloride, they don't go to urinate right away. So the difference is, is that when they're drinking water or other kind of fluids that the body's not holding onto those fluids and, and that creates an issue. Uh, one, one clue to that also is people go to a cardiologist, they have a monogram of the heart and you see a very elevated what we call ejection fraction. When the heart has to work harder and it, it is fluid depleted, that ejection fraction can sometimes be much, much higher. And, and the reason I like this as a first treatment and this really helps a lot is it in a lot of the patients in this hyperactive nervous system, they feel almost an immediate calming in the nervous system. And, and, and I find, and I, and I see this often as we go through more and more cases, that a lot of times we do all these other treatments and they don't work. And, and the reason they may not work is that the nervous system is such a hyperactive state, the body is in such a fight or flight response that it, it nothing has a chance to work. And I have a case from two weeks ago, came to me, was on 10 medications, nothing was working, we actually started giving fluid over a couple of weeks and was interesting. The other medications and the other drugs seemed to work much better. And the other supplements was so interesting where prior to the fluid, they were really struggling and it wasn't really effective. Stabilize, stabilizing glucose and insulin, you know, bringing blood pressure back up and lowering pulse. Next one is we talk about immunomodulation is really getting the immune system to calm down really critical because remember in a lot of the autoimmune cases or histamine cases or reactive bodies overproducing these immune cells and they're not going away and we want to really focus on bringing them down and no one should be surprised by what works vitamin d curcumin resveratrol quercetin and one of my favorites low dose naltrexone and where low dose naltrexone really has a great benefit is really balancing what we call this Th1 and Th2 immune response. The body has two main immune responses. One is Th1, which we really work against what we call pathogens. That's a pro-inflammatory response. We get pneumonia, we get uh, uh, an infection of the skin, that Th1 type cytokine is gonna start being produced. Then we have the other end where we get more of the allergic type response or we call xenophilic response, which is Th2, and that's where we get immunoglobulin E or other interleukins. And what it does is really balance those two together. By balance them two together, that is really effective. And I know, I know people, you know, have heard of low-dose naltrexone. React 19 had, a, I guess, at our conference back in end of April, talked about what was one of the most successful medications. It actually was low-dose naltrexone. And it was really first use was where I saw it was in HIV. They did a small study of about 22 patients and they compared it to another study of 31 patients. And they, in that small study of 22 patients, none of the patients progressed from HIV to AIDS. Whereas in the, the placebo group, about a third of the patients over that same time period develop AIDS. And in the sense they develop what we call opportunistic infections. And they got microbiome issues. So, I apologize to the two gastroenterologists that are listening, if I get this wrong. So the two main ones we think of are the phytobacterium and lactobacillus. And they're really decreased both post-COVID infection and also post-COVID vaccination. And that's really important, especially bifidobacterium, which has such an important immune modulating effect. And then the other ones we see is bacteroides also, and we call that is also effective. Bacteroides is really interesting. Because bacteroides has an, a big effect on what we call the production of GABA. One of the things that's so interesting about neurotransmitters is that most of them are made in the digestive tract. And one of the most important ones that we have is GABA. 
And GABA is the main, what we call inhibitory neurotransmitter works in the brain. That allows our brain to calm down at night so that we can go to sleep. One of the things that's happening is that back to what we call from acuities ratio is disrupted and the body doesn't produce enough GABA. And patient after patient when we've done stool studies, we see that pattern where they're, and that may be another reason why their nervous system is in such a hyperactive state, why cortisol is dysregulated, why people aren't able to sleep at night. And, and I found this interesting study. They actually looked at um, post Pfizer, the BN162B2 COVID-19 vaccine post, post COVID, the number of the two bacteria increased that were problematic, we call bacteroides and astapitis, but then there were 10 others that were decreased. And the one that's so important that's been decreased is really in some cases wiped out is bifobacterium. So important. And it's one of the first microbes when we're children that colonizes the gastrointestinal system. It's so important in our immune system, both adaptive and innate. Adaptive is the secondary immune system. Innate is the initial immune system. We talk about histamines. It, 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 you know, people talk about leaky gut. It protects against leaky gut by keeping the epithelial barrier strong and it helps produce antimicrobial products. So the things obviously that help repopulate this probiotics, but also ivermectin. You know, we've talked a lot about ivermectin through COVID, through vaccine injury. Ivermectin is such an interesting drug that comes from nature that has a really secondary benefit and really restoring gut microbiome and vitamin C and vitamin D as well. And another product, which is a favorite of mine is colostrum or bovine immunoglobulin, which actually also helps in repairing the gut by reducing that inflammatory response by acting as inflammatory, by protecting that epithelial barrier, by helping absorption improve. Remember, for body to really function properly, absorption has to work well. So now the last one is really look at lifestyle and dietary options. Dietary, one of the big that we talked about before, a low histamine diet, how effective, or a controlled carbohydrate diet, autophagy, the concept of intermittent fasting where people actually give the body a rest so that the body can repair or you know, get rid of the debris overnight. I always use the analogy with top G, it's like having a factory where you shut the lights off at the end of the day so the machines can rest. I, I wanna talk about autophagy for one second. I have my own take on it. People talk about the number of hours of fasting. I kind of look at it a little differently. I think it's really critical to finish eating early enough in the evening so that the body finishes digestion by the time you go to sleep. And the reason why that's so critical the, the longest period of repair that happens in the body is overnight. That's when the body's cool and calm and can repair itself. And so I think people that are most effective at that is doing earlier. The group that has to be a little careful at topage is people with hypothyroid can't fast as long as others. Better sleep, where I see a lot of people where their circadian rhythm or cortisol levels are almost reversed, where cortisol, which is normally high in the morning, is low and then it's high at night when it's supposed to be low. People talk about infrared sauna has multiple things about rest restoring muscle function, detoxification, other and repair and resistant training. And, and a big one for me is I, I really discourage a lot of the individuals from over exercising in the beginning because when the body is in, in, in a state where it's not functioning properly, you don't wanna use up all your energy exercising. I think light training, yoga, Pilates, if you can even do that, would be my first step. And we talked about low histamine diet, intermittent fasting. I, I'm a real big fan of a small, easily digestible dinner. I like the European model where dinner is lunchtime and nighttime is supper and really finish eating by six o'clock. And, and what's interesting about six o'clock, I know how to other people, I grew up that way. By six o'clock, my mom closed the kitchen, was clean, we were not allowed back in. And then from a lifestyle, light exercise only, no cardio to beginning walking and resistant training and really getting some restorative sleep, very important. Seven to eight hours, really critical. And for more information, I want to direct people, FLCC, we have our eye recover, both long COVID and post-vaccine treatment protocols online. And I wanna thank everyone for listening. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Berkowitz. That was wonderful. Do you want to take your, your slides off and we can sure. charge ourselves? And I'll start asking you some questions. I jotted them down as they came in. So let's see. The first question, I actually had a couple and then we'll go into the audience's question. Um, a lot of us are taking vitamin K2 with our vitamin D. Will that affect our blood clotting? So my, from a negative standpoint, no. Vita, the only time vitamin K2 is a problem is um, people take Coumadin and warfarin. So vitamin K2 is a really interesting uh, molecule. So if you read a lot of studies on endothelial function, which is the outer layer of the blood vessel, vitamin K2 is so critical for that proper function. And remember, when the endothelium or that outer layer is functioning properly, we're able to move blood much more effectively through the system. Another question, how safe are the natural anti enzymes that are anticoagulants, natokinase, lumbrokinase, serapeptase? Are there any contraindications or drug interactions? So, so we look at a couple of different ones. So one of the things is, of the three, lumbrokinase seems to be the safest. That's some earthworms. It seems to have the lowest blood, uh, bleeding risk. Serapeptase and natokinase both do have a bleeding risk. So if someone has a high bleeding risk, you have to be careful. If someone's on blood thinners, you have to be really careful with those as well too. Typically in older patients, I'll use lumbar kinase only in the beginning, but in a younger patient, I mean, oh, there's so much research looking at nanokinase and its effect on spike protein and how effective it is, but you wanna be a little bit more careful with those two and be careful with other blood thinners. And, and there's natural blood thinners as well too. People forget omega-3 is a natural blood thinner. Curcumin is a natural blood thinner. Vitamin E is a natural blood thinner. So it's not only people who, you know, from medications, but it can also be supplements as well too. Have you seen any bleeding complications from these natural blood thinners? I have not in my practice. So at this point. What do you do when you can't find a doctor who has any experience with vaccine related issues or heart issues from the vaccines? Well, this is more a question for Denise because React 19 has a great website, which I've actually gone to, which helps connect you with clinicians around the country who are appropriate. And, and now in the era of telehealth, you know, you know, we have more options and there's more people available. Is the wellness company regimen, including ivermectin, prednisone, and fluvoxamine safe? So the, when you talk about a regimen, you have, you have to preface it by saying what you're treating, right? And so I, I think you, the question is a little difficult because two factors you need to know. You need to know more about the patient, right? What, what problems they have, what other medications they take, you know, other things with that aspect. And, and prednisone and any medication has side effects. So I think that's a hard question to ask without knowing more history. Do you look into the microbiome of the mouth or the sinuses? I do not, but there are actually holistic dentists that are very, that do uh, mouth microbiome work. It's, the, it's a very common thing. And I do, I don't know the ear, nose, and throat doctors that do the sinus ones, but there are actually holistic dentists that do the mouth biome. All right. Let's see, John asks, uh, he was just diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism. Do you have a preference between prescription anticoagulants or natural enzymes for someone who actually has a blood clot? That's a, it's a, I actually, I was asked that question the day someone post-surgery, they didn't want to take aspirin post-surgery. The problem with some of the natural stuff is the, it's, there's not all clear, there's not always clear guidelines to say how long we treat. And I think, you know, as, as a practitioner, I think you have to be a little careful because there are pretty good guidelines. And the nice thing is in answer preparation, we moved away from more of the dangerous ones like Coumadin and warfarin has been kind of pushed aside and now we're using different, but in my practice, just the way I trade, I will, I will tend to use um, prescription. Right. And that's my comfort level. Again, that's, that's also comfort level of the practitioner you see. Right. 
what do you do if your mi micro clotting tests are positive, which I think most people <laughs> are who get tested? So, so that's, I mean, I mean, there are specialists, Jordan Vaughn, which is, in, is Alabama, he uses oftentimes triple anticoagulant therapy. If I have a, a, a case that is more severe, I will send to him because he's more an expert than I am. More mild cases will often use, you know, it, if they're not having, you know, large blood clots, we'll often use things like lumber kinase, natokinase, seropeptase, and also at the same time, treat the underlying immune issues, right? So the blood clotting is not only blood clotting, but it may be also immune mediated as well. Are there tests to check for endothelial dysfunction or for viral debris? So I'll break them out to two different ones. So there are tests like um, where they look at intermittent thinness. There's some cardiologists called CMIT that looks at endothelial function. For viral debris, I would actually, and I think Robin Rose is on here listening. Robin Rose and Sabine uh, Hassan have done studies looking at viral debris and picking it up in the in the gut microbiome. That's where, I, where we've seen it. So, and one of the interesting things is that they can sometimes see viral debris up to a year later from actually from actually exposure. Is there such a thing as a histamine modulator that assists the system rather than just blocks histamine release? Ah, yes. I think when, when we looked at the other immunomodulators, vitamin D, vitamin curcumin, um, quercetin, low-dose naltrexone do function in that way too, as opposed to the more traditional uh, um, you know, products we think of as antihistamines. Those are all immunomodulators. They also have an, a positive effect in actually modulating histamines. I, I mean, we're finding more and more that kind of combination is really important from starting point, making sure vitamin D, I mean, vitamin D, we've read about throughout the pandemic. If you look at the people that got sick post COVID, one of the common factors we saw over and over again was low vitamin D levels. So that more than anything else is a very powerful immunomodulator. So yes, so reversatrol is another one as well in that category. Where do you personally start with investigating our complex cases? I know that's a hard question because we're all presenting with different syndromes. But. So I actually, I actually have my patients fill out a questionnaire. I actually have a group of about 50 or so symptoms. I let them fill that out first because I like to hear what they, so it's what's also important is what a person what bothers them the most, right? You, when things are so complex and listen, I did my training in HIV. I did my training at Sloan Kettering and cancer. I work with Dr. Ackham. This is far more complicated than all three of those put together. And, and, and that, and that's, and, and I take a good history. I usually spend an hour with my patients in the first visit, most of us do to get a history. And then what I do is when I do blood work, my pre preference, I kind of cast a wide net. I will look at different things based on symptoms from autoimmunity, histamine, um, you know, some of the blood clotting factors we talked about. But I think the most important thing is actually listening to the person. They're going to tell you what, what's most important and what their symptoms are. And the, our job after that is to try and put that, I call it a puzzle, put those puzzle pieces as best together. Is it safe to get IV saline if you are on a blood thinner like Xarelto? Yes. Well, yes, it is safe. Where, where you have to be careful is in someone with cardiac dysfunction, someone that goes into congestive heart failure, that's the group where you have to be much more careful. And also, again, when you're on the blood thinner, you have to make sure when you put an IV in and out that you're holding more after, but yes, you can do it. Um, this person asks, uh, they are injured with chest pain, chronic fatigue, and POTS. LDN made their symptoms worse. I wonder if it was a Herxheimer reaction. What do you recommend in this case? So I have a case of that just a couple of weeks ago, I started mentioning where I, I, and it was a before and after, it was kind of an interesting thing. When I first saw the patient, I was able to start low dose naltrexone. They felt better, but I was also doing IV sailing. They took a three week break from the sailing. The low dose naltrexone was aggravating the symptoms to no end. They, it was causing even hyperimmune response. So when I restarted the saline, they did better. One group you have to be careful with low-dose naltrexone go very slowly. 
is people with a history of Lyme. So people with Lyme disease or high histamines often do not tolerate low dose naltrexone and will go to even a much lower dose in some cases, as low as we call 0.125 and go slowly. But there are several, you know, not every medication is for everyone. And I think oftentimes the sicker someone is, the slower you have to go. And sometimes we forget where you have to really work on calming the system and may take a month or two, things like saline or some of the supplements, repairing the gut microbiome, repair, you know, balancing the blood sugar before you go on to other medications. I have a question about the microbiome. So many of us with MCAS, histamine intolerance, don't tolerate probiotics or foods that have, you know, good bacterial cultures in them very well. What do you do to help your microbiome? I love being asked by the gastroenterologist this question. <laughs> <laughs> With Robin there in the audience, I wish I, I, I can call a friend. <laughs> yeah, call a friend. I haven't figured it out. I've tried every uh, probiotic and, practice of being, you know. And actually, I'll problem. use, interesting enough, I'll often use colostrum first or bovine immunoglobulin first and not use a probiotic. And, and it's interesting, like, and you were, you know where I use this kind of analogy is like people with really bad, oh, here's Robin, she's there. Um, with really bad SIBO, sometimes giving the med the treatment makes them worse, right? Because when you have so much inflammation, I think you have to calm the inflammation down and oftentimes probiotics can actually cause more inflammation in the beginning. Is she able to, she just, uh, she talk, Robin? I don't know. Am I able to unmute? Yes. You're yeah, you're there. This, I'm calling a friend. This is for you. How are you? So what we're finding is in most of the VAX injured patients, they have complete obliteration of their actinobacteria phylum. You have four main phylum in the gut, in the gut microbiome. You have Keith mentioned the bacteroidae species, formicidae species, uh, proteobacteria, and your actinobacteria. Under the actinobacteria phylum are your bifidobacteria species, which are super duper important in the innate immune response, um, really overall functioning, not only of your immune response, your metabolic functioning, production of short chain fatty acids, which are these really important uh, metabolites that help keep the intestinal mucosal barrier intact so that you don't have that leaky gut. And the other thing that these bifidobacteria do, which you guys have both touched on is control the histamine response. Um, so the MCAS and the histamine issues are even more magnified in patients with this wipeout of the bifidobacteria. So there's many things that help grow back the bifidobacteria and Keith did touch on them. And while some of these things are costly, that's why I'm going to be careful in what I say, but um, high dose IV vitamin C, 25 grams, um, there are studies that support that they help boost and grow the bifidobacteria species. And what we do is if patients can, it's not really sustainable. So if they can initially do some high, high dose uh, treatment for four to six weeks, then we bridge them and we put them on high dose buffered C. Um, about 10,000 a week, like I do 5,000 bi-weekly actually. Um, and then another thing that works really great um, is this combination zinc CD that we use. Actually, Sabine has a really good, she actually studied it too um, for boosting bifidobacteria. And um, that's usually for like an eight-week course, but that combination is really great, not just for boosting the bifido, but helping with leaky gut. And then what Keith had said too, we use a lot of bovine immunoglobulins, uh, serum immunoglobulins. Those are great because they help with overall diversity. So actually studies show that it actually increases the firmicides, decreases the bacteroidides, decreases the proteobacteria and increases the actinobacteria. So that's really what you want. So using that combination along with a food first approach is super important. And, and it is interesting, you mentioned about like not being able to eat certain foods and that's because anything that's fermented is going to bother you, right? And so, yeah, you're right. So really trying to go low and go slow with these while you build back and then eventually and you heal up the leaky gut, you should be able to tolerate these foods again very slowly. And so it's also interesting about that as you repair that gut, 
people's mood gets better. So they start making more of the neurotransmitters. Remember, she talked about back to Rorty's and opportunities that, and that's so important. So as you have more GABA involved, that also helps compound the gut as well. And I think that more than, you know, most other treatments is so important for people to recover. That's fascinating. <laughs> and we'll turn over the whole field of psychiatry one day. <laughs> all in our gut. Okay, we have we have a lot of more questions. So tell me when Thank you're you, Robin. when you're done. Okay. okay. John asks, do, do you use energy medicine in your treatment like red or near infrared light, RIFE, cold laser therapy, et cetera? I don't, but because I'm it's not my expertise, but I'm starting to learn. I'm I'm slow in that game, but I, I do not at this point. But I need to learn more because it's some of the stuff is very interesting. And I think, you know, another treatment modality that we need to look at better. Right. I wanted to bring up the issue of IVIG, which is, you know, a big issue. A lot of people are getting it or SCIG. And I, I think we might have some other experts in the audience who may want to touch on it. But do you have a lot of patients on IVIG? Dr. Gazla, I think, is in the audience. Yeah. I, I don't, but I think. Uh, Suzanne Gazda is there too. We'll call another friend. Can we call <laughs> Suzanne? <laughs> if she's up there, she's the expert on that. Yes. I think she'd be really helpful. If I think she's here. But I'm, I'm looking just, for I I'm think just, she might have popped off. I'll see if I can find her. I'm just huh. curious. Uh, the patients that you have that do get IVIG or SCIG from other experts, do you find that it's helping them? In, in some case, I think one of the interesting thing is I have, a, a, let me give you an example of a case I have. It, it's actually a doctor, my sickest patient, and it's not vaccine, but long COVID, he has over 80, 90 autoantibodies. So he has such a, and his histamine levels are 140 times normal. I've never seen anything like this. He has autoantibodies that I've never seen in men. He has. It, it's So I think that group really seems to do well with that. I mean, in that kind of case, I would refer out to someone else because that's beyond my expertise. But yeah, I mean, I think with, do you find that same experience with high levels of order immunity, that group tends to, you know, do better. But what's interesting about it is they have to continue on the treatments. They end up staying on the treatments long-term in yeah. a lot of cases. Dr. Gasta hopped off. So I think, oh, maybe Denise, maybe we just need to line her up so she can give us like a lecture on the whole thing. Right. Yeah, she, she would be the, for the best expert on that. Yeah. Speaking of long-term treatment, do you think those of us who are on LDN and having some benefit from it should stay on it for the long-term, given so, our regulation? Robin, myself, and Suzanne had a discussion about this the other day. I, I think the problem is, and, and what's happened when I've stopped treatment in patients, oftentimes they'll rebound. And, and one of the problems is we, we haven't solved the underlying issue, right? If you think about it, which is either the the you know lipid nanoparticle or the spike protein and one of the things we're really missing from treatment is a spike protein asset to know how much spike protein so the problem is and and i've seen this three or four times my patients like i want to stop it i'm feeling good two months later they're right back where they started and i think until we really figure out how to fully you know detox from the spike protein or even more first measure the spike protein and figure out what that is i i, I think for now, I'm, I am keeping patients on the treatment protocols. What do you feel, Denise? Do you feel yeah, the same I thing? I, I, I'm committed to staying on it probably lifelong. And, and the nice thing about lotus naltraxone, it has over a 40-year history of right. use. And very little downside, if, if any, really. But I, I always, and one, one thing about using it is I'm a big fan of going slow. And, and I always remind people, and I've meant such as them before, the sicker someone is, the slower you have to go which is almost counterintuitive because a lot of times when someone's so inflamed, when you start attacking that inflammation, that can trigger a lot of symptoms. Definitely. Let's see, we have many questions. Have you, uh, what have you seen regarding lactic acidosis or acidosis in general? And what have you been using to help treat it? Ah, so I like that question. Mm -hmm. It goes back to mitochondrial issues. So, 
if people, let me put, let me explain what lactic acid is. Anyone who's played sports on a hot day, played tennis or basketball, and their muscles start cramping afterwards, that's lactic acidosis. We also know it's lactic acidosis in the hospital when people are sick. So that's what it is really is when the body or the mitochondria switches from what we call aerobic or oxygen-based energy, right? With mitochondria, we call ATP to anaerobic. And what and one of the things that I really find it goes back to the use of saline is really good with magnesium. Thiamine B1 is a great product for actually reducing lactic acid in the body. Um, Low dose naltrexone is helpful, vitamin D, anything to keep the muscles. But I mean, my favorite is actually magnesium. Using, I use magnesium a lot either as a topical. I, I have a long history of using magnesium intramuscular. I often use it for people with fibromyalgia. I saw a patient with migra chronic migraines today. We do that a lot, especially when it comes to neck. So magnesium intramuscular is really good at increasing blood flow to the body. Another one we sometimes use is L arginine. The only thing you have to be careful with L-arginine is someone who has Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. You really need to stay away from it because it can trigger that. Speaking of Epstein-Barr virus, can you give <laughs> us a, just a little uh, summary of how you diagnose reactivated EBV serologically? And, so and, that, that, and one last is, thing, and how does the EBV PCR play into it? So this is one of the biggest controversies, right? If you really look at the literature, only 5% of reactivated Epstein-Barr actually have IgM antibodies, right? Which are the acute antibodies. So you now have a group of 95% that don't have them. And, and the, again, the PCR is also in that same group, right? That's gonna be that acute group as well too. So the problem is, it's I think a clinical diagnosis in some ways, but sometimes people have very high titers that we call IgG, which is old virus, but, and you, you know this from practice before, for years we thought that meant nothing, right? We ignored that, meant that, but I think our best measure, when titers are high, chances are there's more antigen involved, right? So the body is responding to some kind of, we call an antigen, which is the virus, to produce more of an antibody response. So mm -hmm. I, and what's interesting about that is two people can have one, someone can have low titers and be symptomatic, and someone could have very high titers and have no symptoms. So I think the other aspect to treating reactivated is really symptomatology. And what symptoms do you go by? So fatigue is a very large one. Swollen lymph nodes is a large one. Uh, muscle aches is a, is a big one we see. You can have elevated liver function tests, but I think fatigue is, is and now we're learning, and I mentioned in my presentation for a second, it may be the trigger of a lot of autoimmune disease. I have a great case of, re, of acute Epstein-Barr causing uveitis, iritis of the eye, inflammation of the eye. And they went to an ophthalmologist and the ophthalmologist is like, oh, they have an autoimmune disease. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's called Epstein-Barr. They're like, no, they have an autoimmune disease that people don't recognize a lot of times that Epstein-Barr virus can be a trigger of autoimmune disease. And, and we're learning more and more. Could you briefly review how you do treat reactivated EBV? Do you have a protocol? So, a couple of things. So one... To, to, traditionally, people have used medications like Valtrex and acyclovir. I, I think they they suppress the symptoms. I don't think. Remember, we're probably not going to cure reactivated Epstein Barr. It's, I find ivermectin is actually very effective. I actually use it at a lower dose for a longer period of time. Another drug which is kind of interesting is you know this is in your world, the Lena, which is nitro oxanide. So that also has an effect. Monolaurin. So I actually go through each. So ivermectin works by preventing the virus from being uptake by the nucleus. So it doesn't spread that way. Monolaurin, which is really an interesting, it's a natural substance that comes from coconut oil, is really interesting because it actually destroys the outer layer of the virus. So it's actually really helpful from, you know, preventing the virus from spreading and very well tolerated. And, and again, nitrooxanide is a little interesting. It actually destroys the mitochondrial function of a virus. So and, and I find that one you have to be a little more careful with because if someone has high levels, they actually can, we call Hertz or kind of detox from it. But those are very, I, I tend to use those three and vitamin D, vitamin C, I'll use low dose naltrexone with that to try and calm down the immune system as well. What do you think about graded exercise therapy? 
Rated X in what aspect? <laughs> you mean for a, a vaccine injured patient? Well, I think that maybe they're referring to pacing, which is often recommended for the injured, pacing their energy expenditure. Oh, oh, I, I'm a big believer in that. And I mentioned before, I'm not a big fan of cardio. I look at it this way, right? Say you normally have 100 units of energy, right? That's your body. Now, when your body's depleted, you're at 30, 40 units of energy. You don't want to use them all up before the day ends. So you have to be very careful. I, I do like that idea, if that's what rated. I, I, I haven't heard the term before. I think us down. the person who asked said for chronic fatigue. So I think that makes so slowly increasing over time makes a lot of sense. But again, I would only do that in someone when their system is calmed down, when they're well hydrated, there's not active inflammation. So you got to be careful doing too much exercise when there's active inflammation. Right. It can and cause harm as well. Many of us suffer when we exert ourselves. We pay for it for days. Um, is it safe to take LDN if you are using benzos for sleep aid? So the, the answer, they're not contraindicated together. Benzos, benzodiazepines work for a mechanism. They work on GABA. They're, they on GABA receptors, which whereas LDN works on an opioid receptor, where you have to be careful is obviously opioid. Where also LDN has another interesting kind of side effect. When people drink alcohol, they don't get the pleasure from it because it blocks some of that receptor as well. But opioids are the big, big category you have to be careful with. Uh, Ryan asks, I have chest pain following Pfizer vaccination. I take statins, aspirin, and Plavix and natokinase, could I take LDN also? Um, yeah, I, the, none of those are contraindicated with LDN. Again, it's, I mean, you have to do, I would do that with the setting of a doctor or a provider, it's an, you know, any medical provider, but it's not contraindicated with that. Right, I haven't really or found any, any drug interactions with LDN. No, except for, I mean, obviously opioids is the only direction. Yeah. So there, there's yeah. an interesting, so, where people have to be careful with LDN if they're going for surgery. So yeah. that's one thing and I, I try and tell people because you may not, you may end up with opioid and, and you, we usually stop it two days before and we'll restart it after they're off the medications. And oftentimes if it's a short period of time, you can go right back to that same dose again. And just for everyone's understanding, it's because if you're blocking the opioid receptors, pain medication won't have any effect. So you don't want You'll to be very unhappy and not have pain, <laughs> right? Do you accept Canadian patients? Um, unfortunately, I'm licensed in four states. Canada is a separate country, so it's it's New York, New Jersey, uh, Florida, and California. But if they came to see you, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, of course. We but, do. New York does border Canada. This is a similar question about how you treat EBV, but what about Lyme reactivation? So for Lyme, I, I would point you for Lyme, the real expert out there is, is, is out of South Carolina, J.P. Salibi. Did you, I think you guys have had him before. He really is Lyme expert because Lyme, you have to also, it's a little more complicated because there's also the co-infections, Babesia, Bartonella, Arcolosis. So you have to, when you treat Lyme, you have to look at all, mechanisms from that. So you really need to see a Lyme specialist. And, yeah. and I, I would recommend him very highly. He's out of South Carolina. So Tina asks, first of all, thank you, Dr. Berkowitz. What is the best course of action for severe post-exertional fatigue and pain? So you want to figure out what the cause is, right? So that could be a couple different things. It could be post-viral. It could be post-inflammatory. Epstein-Barr virus as part of that post-viral. It could be histamine mediated. It could be also microclotting. So you kind of have to look at all those aspects to try and make a diagnosis. And oftentimes we'll pick one or two to kind of look at first. And and I and in that case, I actually like things like fluid. I do like low dose naltrexone. So to at least get the body in a more calm state, I think is helpful as well. But you have to investigate all the different mechanisms as well. Do you have any thoughts on cold plunges or ice baths for treatment of long COVID? I find that really fascinating. One day I will try it myself, but it's interesting. So, if, I mean, it, it, it actually has a long history, right? 
if you think about when we do surgery oftentimes, isn't that what we do to the body to, to allow the body to heal, right? We bring the body down to a low temperature, especially in things like cardiac surgery. I think it's fascinating. Um, it's not my expertise, but I think it's definitely something we need to investigate more. I, this question hasn't come up yet, but could you talk a little bit about methylene blue? That's a popular topic right now. I actually don't use it a lot in my practice. I mean, methylene blue is really interesting. It, it has a very good, enormous effect on mitochondrial function. And, and we didn't really talk much, much today about mitochondrial function, which really is important because I remember that's really energy uh, kind of strong point of the cell. I probably would not be the best person to talk about it. I think, I think what would be interesting is maybe have JP. Also, he uses a lot of methylene blue. It's just not my, my standard of practice, but he would be much better. And also, actually, there is, if you go to the FLCC website, there is a couple of, Dr. Mobin Syed actually has done a couple of videos on how methylene blue is used and how it functions. Do you think there are any uh, risks involved with using methylene blue? I, I think I think in any substance. I mean, I think that's another one you have to go very gently to do very slowly to, you know, because again, people again can have a kind of we call it my reaction or a detox type reaction from it. It's a very potent product. Yeah. And if you take too much of it, it's toxic. So you have to, it has to be monitored very carefully. Um, Natto kinase and eloquist together, is that a problem? That's a Jordan Vaughn question, but, but they do use, some people do, I mean, again, microclotting is not my expertise, but they often will do both together. Again, you want to be more careful. Again, you know, the more substances that have blood thinning type properties, the more risk of obviously bleeding you will get. And, and beyond that, uh, triple anticoagulant. And, and someone, some mentioned it, some in the, I'm in the chat that they'll use it together. Yeah, they'll use triple. I mean, he's really the expert on that, but you gotta be really careful with it. Yeah, very careful. Let's see. Here and one thing, can I make more comment? One thing I like about the way he does that is he'll actually then also look at the blood under microscope. So he'll be able to follow you over time to see that that blood clotting does resolve because that is a therapy that's not meant for long-term, but it's used for a short period of time and then stops. Here in New York City, I have been unable to find a doctor to test the anti-ACE2 antibody and associated blood work. Can you recommend a lab here? That's a challenge. I mean, what we've seen is maybe uh, Robin knows differently. I, a lot of people send their away to Germany. They do it out of the country. I've, I've not seen any labs. Um, a cell trend, someone mentioned cell trend. I'm not familiar. See, New York is a little bit more challenging. A lot of laboratories you can use elsewhere are not licensed in New York. So it's a much more difficult state to get you know, that tested. Right. Yeah, cell, I think most of us have use cell trends to get those results. Uh, is cell trend licensed in New York? I'm not sure they are. That's maybe- I don't issue. think they're licensed in the United States. I mean, you have yeah. to send your blood to Germany. Oh yeah, it's in Germany. So yeah, it's in Germany, yep. That's the only one I've heard of from that aspect. How is it best to get rid of the spike protein if it still persists two years later? <laughs> I guess we don't, you know, we don't know that's, that for a that's fact. That's our challenge. Yeah. So- I like anyone who has that answer, please raise the hand. That's, that's really what we're, that's really what our challenge is. I mean, we know certain substances, Robin, thank you. Yeah. Certain substances yeah. and Robin is working with some, uh, Vanessa, she, she could talk about it more, but products to look at that. There's one product that comes out of India that is kind of interesting to really look at spike protein. I think the one caveat to that is really, again, we need to have an assay that we can actually look at to, to show that that's gone. And, and he, she is correct. It's not one product, but it's it's a combination of uh, of different products. And maybe uh, Robin, maybe you can, we'll post that. You can you can send something and we can post that so people can see the, that product. But do you think we're close to ever being able to measure spike protein in our bodies? Well, I, I think that goes back to, see, one of the challenges, how much do we have, right? We're back to that same challenge, you know, from that same aspect. I, I think, again, 
hopefully within the next six months a year, I, I, I hope that someone comes up with an assay so we can really have a more proper measurement. Because I, I, the problem without that, we're really unsure what levels are there. Okay, this person asks, are all blood tests have come back normal except cholesterol, but symptoms still point to vaccine injury. Stool analysis shows extremely high secretory IgA. What other blood tests or other tests do you recommend, please? Can you bring the first part of that again? Say yes. it one more time. All my blood tests have come back normal except cholesterol, but symptoms still point to vaccine injury. Stool analysis shows extremely high secretory IgA. What other blood tests or other tests do you recommend? So what's interesting, so cholesterol can also be high as well if, if there is malabsorption as well. And secretory IgA can often be off in things like inflammatory things. Well, this is your category too. It, you know, gluten intolerance. I would look at other things like, you know, other stool testing. I like to look at lactoferrin, things like calipectin. But again, the problem with blood tests is they're not always specific for that. And also what blood tests were done is the other question. Like, have they looked at autoantibodies? Have they looked at histamine? Have they looked at Epstein-Barr virus? I mean, there's more things that you can look at. And so the question is, have, first of all, have they done all the blood tests necessary? Number two is, again, looking at stool from an inflammatory standpoint is also helpful as well, too. Right, someone said underfunctioning thyroid or uh, you know malabsorption of the gut, where if you can't process fat, you'll often have a high cholesterol level as well, too. Um, you mentioned GABA issues. If someone is having extreme trouble with insomnia, how can you fix the GABA issues or what do you do to get sleep? So, so a couple of, so GABA is something you can use. You want to start very gentle and slowly. I also use things like theanine, which have theanine and magnesium, which all have GABA support, which are not, not direct GABA. So some, again, sometimes the more insomnia, the more you got to be gentle. I mean, there were also things like looking at MTHFR. If there's a neurotransmitter issue, that can affect sleep. I would also check cortisol levels. There's a great, a lot of labs do really great cortisol testing, including um, 24 hour salivary cortisol. So you can actually see, you know, morning, late morning, afternoon, evening, or bedtime and see if that's off. So I would actually do more of a workup. Insomnia, thyroid can have effect. There's another one, right? Thyroid function is another thing. So there are other, we call underlying medical conditions, I would rule those out first before I did other things. Dr. Berkowitz, it's 10 minutes after the hour. We can stop now. Um, or if you want to answer a couple more, let me know. Well, let's do two more. Two more. Okay. Now this is important. What is the most current treatment for tinnitus due to the vaccine for tonight? Uh, so I have to tell you, that is the toughest symptom to treat, the most difficult, and, and seems to be more difficult the longer it comes out. So a couple of things people have looked at. People have looked at things like uh, antioxidants like glutathione and, it, and acetylcysteine. We've, I've even tried intranasal glutathione as well. Um, ivermectin sometimes, where it depends on, I think that's one you have to catch early. So the longer that happens, the more damage done, much, much, much more trouble to treat. Other things that may work, L, I sometimes use l taurine which is another amino acid that sometimes can have a positive effect. Vitamin C may have a positive effect. One of the theories is the inability to oxidate, uh, where you have you don't have enough antioxidants, those oxidative levels are low, that has an effect. Um, I, I, a small one, which sometimes we forget, is even histamine mediator or congestion mediator, right? For people have nasal congestion, that can also affect it. But I have to tell you the hardest of all is to treat of any symptom I believe that I've seen so far, or one of the hardest is tinnitus, unfortunately. And the longer it goes without being treated, the harder it is to treat. Okay, this will be our last question from John. Is venous insufficiency and or compression a common sequela of long COVID and vaccine injury? If so, would this have adverse upstream arterial slash venual effects on diffuse tissue oxygenation? Wow, that's a complicated question. I, I, don't see, I don't see a lot of it. I mean, normally we think of 
bad venous insufficiency, which is the veins don't work, typically the valves. You'll see pooling of blood in the feet oftentimes. People get ankle swelling. Uh, again, what's interesting, and may just be my practice, I tend to get a lot younger vaccine injury, so that may be more an issue. But again, if, if you have venous pooling, again, remember that's the other way. Oxy oxygenation of blood is arterial. It, it, it's the opposite direction. Venus more, but, but again, it can affect their exercise tolerance. It could affect their ability to walk because again, you get pooling of fluid in, in, in the ankles. Okay, I think we're gonna end it even though we have about 10 more. Maybe we can send them to you and you <laughs> could give us a few pointers. Thank you Thank so you. much. This was- Thank you so much for having you. I really appreciate it. I, I hope we can do this again because this kind of information is priceless for us. And can I end with a can I end with a point? I just want a, a point. And one of the most for me from a treatment standpoint, and I want to remind I, I learn so much from my patients that they don't even understand. Like again, as practitioners, we're, we're we only know what we see. And what's really important, and I really tell people, you have to be the source for them. Like I, I mean, I'm really blessed I have my patients come in and teach me as much as I teach them that show me how symptoms fit together. That is so critical. And you have to really become your own advocate because without being that, you don't get the care you need. Well, as you probably know, we've all experienced going to doctors that know nothing about vaccine injury and don't even acknowledge vaccine injury. So it's been a struggle and we've had to you know, educate our doctors and educate ourselves. And, and actually that was my first lesson I learned from Dr. Atkins. He's, he taught me the way to change medicine is to change the customer, not the provider. <laughs> that's very and the customer true. will change the provider or that's the client so will change true. the provider. So true. I believe that. Well, thank you. And I hope we have another session with you in the future because there'll be a lot more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.